Hello and welcome to Biomaterials in Action, a special programme that investigates the problems of living with and managing debilitating and painful chronic dermal wounds. In particular, we'll be examining the work of the Derma Project, which is comprised of a group of academic researchers and clinicians co-funded by the European Union Interreg 2 Cs programme. Derma was formed with the specific goal to improve the welfare of patients suffering from these distressing wounds. The project recently announced the results of its four-year work program to develop new materials intended for management and treatment of these chronic dermal wounds, including ulcers of the leg and foot. In context, it's estimated up to 2% of the EU population suffers from these painful and unpleasant wounds at any given time, with this figure increasing greatly with age. The management of these by healthcare workers costs the EU six and a half billion euros each year. Chronic ulcers can also take a long time to heal, require extensive management by healthcare workers, and despite this, may still be subject to poor healing outcomes. Of special concern in the management of these wounds is the intermittent eruption of painful and damaging bacterial infections within the wound site, and the unpleasant odour they release. Indeed, some patients suffering from such malodorous chronic wounds may experience embarrassment, depression, and social isolation. I asked Professor Simon Toe from the Portsmouth NHS Trust to describe his experience of caring for patients with malodorous wounds. Hi, I'm Simon Toe, consultant surgeon at Portsmouth Hospital University NHS Trust. I manage surgical wounds every day. Smelly wounds or infection or necrosis is a common problem for our patients and their care teams, both in hospital and at home. They are a source of deep embarrassment for our patients and can lead to patients isolating themselves, leading to mental problems like depression. On wards, the smell of wounds is a major problem for our nurses and other patients and has been shown to reduce appetite and increase anxiety. Humans have an inherent aversion to bad smells, and so these patients tend to get less care and attention. It therefore follows that removing the odour can be transformative, ideally by treating the infection or removing necrotic tissue. But where this is not possible or there are delays between dressings, we need a better way to manage the odour. Thank you, Simon. To give further insight into the experiences of those living with chronic wounds, here is a short scene depicting a typical conversation between a patient with a foot ulcer and a podiatrist treating them. Self today. Are you okay? Oh, to be honest, not really. Ever since I had this wound, I, I, I keep thinking it's going to be the, the last wound I've had. That took six months to heal. It's a dreadful experience. Just everything seems to have gone wrong. I, I, I can't do the things that I used to do. I don't go out anymore. I don't go out on Fridays anymore. I just feel really cut off. You mentioned that you were worried about the odour from your foot. Yes, I, I think it smells. It hasn't been near a bath or a shower for ages. I'm, I'm really worried that it smells. We can see then that these wounds can cause great concern for patients to the extent that their confidence and quality of life can be significantly adversely affected. Fortunately, some products are available to help alleviate the malodor of chronic wounds, and these can work well for easy to access wounds. However, certain types of wounds can be very difficult for clinicians to dress with conventional materials. I asked experienced podiatrist Rachel Force from the Leaf Hospital in Eastbourne on the south coast of England to explain. Patients want to get on with their quality of life, really. They don't want to be restricted. Um, they don't want anything that's going to cause them discomfort or pain. Um, they want to keep active. They require something that is pain-free to remove and apply. It's comfortable. It conforms to the area where you apply it, where the wound is. Um, 
not too bulky, they want to be able to carry on with their day-to-day -day life um, and it's not going to be too restrictive so they don't want it to be too obvious um, and they just want to carry on with day-to-day -day life as much as possible. Bacterial infections of chronic wounds are a significant clinical problem. I spoke with Professor Stan Munstre, a plastic surgeon with expertise in treating burn injuries and chronic wounds from the Department of Plastic and Reconstructive Surgery, Ghent University Hospital, Belgium, to explain his approach to the treatment of skin infections. Burn wounds belong to the group of the chronic wounds and burn wounds, in my opinion, are more at risk of becoming infected. For this reason, antiseptic and antimicrobial agents are probably more important than in any other wound. I think burns do have two specific uh, characteristics. One, first of all, is that usually the skin is damaged over pretty larger areas, which means that these wounds are more than other wounds at risk of becoming infected. And uh, the second thing is that sometimes the healing takes a long time and therefore also the risk of infection at a later stage is, uh, is higher probably than other wounds. This has, by the way, been shown by the fact that uh, long-standing burn wounds or burn wounds that take a long time to heal are always full of biofilm, which makes it even more difficult for the antiseptic uh, or antimicrobial agents to, uh, to become effective. But the conclusion is that almost all wound dressings for burn wounds do have an antiseptic or antimicrobial agent uh, included, uh, usually all already by rinsing, but also uh, involved in the wound dressings itself. Since the wound dressings are often very painful and they cause a lot of discomfort and require a lot of work to be changed on a daily basis. It has become more and more important to have antiseptic agents with an extended or a slow release, which means that the antiseptics still remain effective, but you don't have to change the wound on, uh, on a daily basis. Of course, also the degree of moisture of the wound is a very important uh, aspect for the treating of these burn wounds. Thank you, Stan. It's apparent then that chronic dermal ulcers are a common and serious problem for society. They are painful and can produce unpleasant odors that are distressing for the patient. Intermittent and difficult to treat infections can erupt within these wounds, causing the condition of patients to deteriorate even to the extent that an infected limb could be lost. It is in this context that Derma Consortium challenged itself to develop new materials for the improved management of such dermal wounds. After the break, the Derma team will describe in detail the development of these materials. Before the break, we heard that chronic dermal ulcers are a major problem for society. They are painful, produce distressing malodors, and they can worsen due to difficult to treat intermittent bacterial infections. We also learned that a consortium of EU scientists and designers working on a project called Derma had set themselves a challenge to develop new materials for the management of these problematic wounds. I asked the Derma project leader, Dr. Ian Allen, of the Centre for Regenerative Medicine and Devices at the University of Brighton to describe the project in more detail. Well, the Derma project built on previous collaborations between researchers from the universities of Brighton and Portsmouth in the UK and the University of Ghent in Belgium. These projects being concerned with the development of biomaterials for dermatological applications. 
Uh, for Derma, we also recruited Eurosante from Lille in France, which is an agency that facilitates the tech transfer of healthcare products to market. The Derma Consortium was multidisciplinary in nature. It included polymer chemists, microbiologists, material and digital designers, tech transfer specialists and clinicians. And we realised as a consortium that in terms of collective expertise, we were in a good position to develop materials that could potentially improve in what was already available in the field of wound care, especially in the management of chronic dermal ulcers. So the consortium decided to intervene in this field in three areas by making materials intended to one, help manage the unpleasant odours produced from dermal ulcers, two, tackle bacterial infections within these wounds with improved efficiency, and three, produce a material designed to give a visual indication that a bacterial infection is taking hold within a wound. As Ian mentioned, the Derma Consortium has been developing new materials that can manage the unpleasant odours associated with chronic wounds, whilst possessing favourable physical properties applicable to wound care management. I asked Ian about the materials he's been developing at the University of Brighton for wound odour control. The Derma team was working on a number of materials to help manage malodour in wounds. Uh, one of the most promising materials developed at the University of Brighton was composed of agaros, agaros being derived from seaweed. Many people will be familiar with agaros gels, uh, sometimes referred to as agar, and these being used for a variety of purposes, especially in scientific laboratories and for culinary uses. What is less well known about these agarose gels is that they can be dried to form transparent and very brittle films. But to overcome this brittleness, a non-toxic plasticizer can be added to the gel mixture before drying, producing films that are very much like cling film in appearance. So these agarose films are non-toxic and they are biodegradable. In the context of medical materials such as wound dressings, they have low adherence so they won't stick to the skin or indeed the cells within a wound. The films are breathable, that is, they allow the passage of water vapour, meaning that if films are held close to the skin, excessive sweat and moisture won't build up, which can potentially lead to tissue destruction, known as maceration. For wound odour capture, we incorporated activated carbon particulates into these plasticised agarose films. Activated carbon has a well-known uh, capacity to capture or absorb small molecules on account of its very high surface area to volume ratio. So once developed, these activated carbon containing plasticized agarose films were assessed for their ability to capture malodors typically found in chronic wounds. We also incorporated a special polymer into some versions of these films, one which has a remarkable ability to absorb water. This gave the option of having a film that is able to swell greatly in the presence of moisture uh, with the intended function of absorbing excessive exudate from a chronic wound in addition to the odour capturing properties. So the more of the absorbent polymer that is present in the initial formulation of the material, the more moisture can be absorbed. So in theory, we could tailor uh, these materials to wounds with differing exudate volumes from relatively dry wounds to runny or sloughy wounds. Um, we're very pleased with the feel of these materials. They're easy to handle and they can be cut to shape with scissors. The films are heat sealable, so this allows the activated carbon to be fully enclosed in kind of a sandwich arrangement with laminates of our plasticized agarose enclosing an inner activated carbon agarose layer to prevent direct contact of the activated carbon with the wound bed. Thank you, Ian. As we have learned, some of the unpleasant odours from chronic dermal ulcers are caused by the action of bacteria in the infected wound. Therefore, the Derma Consortium also set itself the task of trying to improve the treatment of such infections by developing materials that can release, over an extended period of time, antimicrobial agents that can inhibit or kill the bacteria responsible for these painful infections. The materials developed to deliver these antimicrobial agents necessary to tackle these infections have been produced by a method known as electrospinning. I asked Professor Peter Dubruel of the Polymer Chemistry and Biomaterials Research Group at the University of Ghent, Belgium, to describe this process in more detail. So within the DERMA project, we have had the pleasure of applying an innovative technique 
which is called electrospinning, with the aim to produce polymer mats. The reason for doing so is related to the fact that in our bodies, cells are embedded in the so-called extracellular matrix, and this matrix is also composed of these randomly distributed fibers, which are then composed of biopolymers. During this technique, an electrical field is applied uh, onto a polymer solution and via a complex uh, cascade of events that leads to these electrospun mats. The beauty of the technology is that both small and large scale uh, materials can be developed uh, at a uh, high speed. And more importantly, they can also be loaded with biologically active compounds, which actually then enable compounds like antimicrobial compounds, which can then be released over time when they come into contact with the wound bed. So the versatility can be found both in the type of polymers that are applied, but also in the antimicrobial agent, and of course, through the technique of electrospinning, which tries to mimic the so-called extracellular matrix to the highest extent possible, as this technique enables us to produce materials with a high, very high even, surface to volume ratio. Thank you, Peter. In the following footage, Dr. Arne Minion, also of the Polymer Chemistry and Biomaterials Research Group at the University of Ghent, Belgium, demonstrates the electrospinning process in the laboratory. To be able to electrospin something, you first have to make it. So, polymerization, to create the materials which we will electrospin in the next step, are actually uh, made with these systems. At the beginning, we have to make our materials. Then, we make some sheets out of it. We test some with mechanical properties. Um, we do some other tests for characterization and afterwards we will um, mix them in the solvent. We put them in the electrospinning, we electrospin the fibers. Then with electron microscope we look at them on a sub-micron scale and then we go to the next step where we can incorporate the odor absorbing or the color indication. We have seen how the electrospin materials are produced in the laboratory and that they are extremely thin. I asked Professor Sandra van Bleerberg, also of the Ghent Group, to explain the advantages these fibres possess. So we can control uh, wound exudate uptake with our hydrogels by using different chemical tools. One aspect which we can use is the length of uh, our polymer chains. If we use polymers with a higher molar mass, which implies uh, a longer uh, chain length, the material will swell more. And this means that it can also take up higher amounts of wound exudate. If we use polymers with a shorter chain length, uh, the material will swell less and will take up lower amounts of wound exudate. A second uh, building uh, block or, or a second methodology we can exploit is uh, the degree of network uh, density. If we use higher network densities and a higher cross-linking degree, our network will swell less. And as a result, it will be more appropriate to serve lower exudating wounds or less exudating wounds. If we have a network which is uh, less tightly cross-linked, then it means it can swell more and is also more appropriate to apply onto wounds which show a lot of wound exudate. This wound exudate is also crucial because it uh, contains a lot of growth factors which can aid the wound healing process. And therefore, it's important to also keep this uh, exudate close to the wound throughout the healing process. And that's um, why your hydrogels really need to be tuned towards the application and with this tool set of uh, chemical building blo blocks we can exploit, it means we can create hydrogel dressings which are appropriate either to treat less exudating wounds or more exudating wounds in line with the wound healing profile required uh, for the application. Thank you, Sandra. As well as trying to tackle existing wound infections by developing materials that can release antimicrobial agents, the Derma team also wanted to produce a material that would give a visual early warning that an infection was in the process of developing within a wound, enabling much earlier intervention by healthcare workers before a serious infection can take hold. I asked Dr. Allen to describe the work undertaken by the Derma team 
to produce such a diagnostic material? Well, we wanted to produce a material that would give an easy to understand signal that an infection is starting to develop within a wound, indicating that intervention is required to prevent the condition of the wound from deteriorating. Early in the project, uh, when deciding what our material should be designed to detect, uh, we considered a number of factors that have been reported to be indicative of bacterial infection within a wound. Uh, these included changes in wound pH, temperature and also the presence of specific molecules within a wound. In the end, we decided to detect bacterial activity directly uh, using a special dye that changes colour from dark blue to bright pink in response to the presence of growing bacteria. So this dye, uh, which is called resazurin, has been used for many years to detect bacterial growth and it was first used to monitor uh, the spoilage of milk. Uh, the teams from the universities of Brighton and Ghent were working on means to incorporate this dye within their candidate dressing materials at Brighton within the Agaros films previously mentioned and again uh, using their electrospun fibres. It was important that when the dye was added to these materials that, would, that it would be retained efficiently within them and not leach out. In other words, we didn't want the dye to fade from the materials and to leach into the wound bed. It was also important that the expected blue to pink colour change could still occur when the dye was incorporated into these materials in the same way that it would do when it was in its free form. Uh, this proved to be quite a challenge. After all, there doesn't appear to be a similar dressing uh, on the market. However, ultimately, we think we've made good progress. It's obvious that any material intended to be applied to wounds must be acceptable for the patient. Similarly, healthcare workers would need to be convinced of the clinical need for the material and be able to apply it with relative ease. I asked Dr Cressida Boya of the Centre for Creative and Cultural Industries at the University of Portsmouth how the Derma team was able to understand the needs of patients and clinicians. Throughout the project, we've hosted focus group discussions with patients, carers and clinicians to talk about wound dressing requirements. The University of Portsmouth Ageing Network identified and invited patient representatives to help us understand the problems associated with chronic wounds from the patient perspective. This helped us to identify unmet needs and research objectives for new dressing designs. Fashion and textiles expert Tom Cooley visited the dressing clinic at Leaf Hospital and consequently Tom and Professor Joan Farrer were able to advise derma scientists on desirable material properties for difficult to dress areas of the body. Scientists in the Faculty of Technology went on to test and assess the derma materials according to these parameters. We produced a short empathy film both as a touchstone for the research team and also for public dissemination. This film was scripted following a visit to the dressing clinic. As well as being helpful for derma researchers, there are plans to use the film as a teaching tool for carers and clinicians to help them understand and empathise with patients. Health psychologist Dr Ms Al Abadi is carrying out research into the lived experience of people with chronic wounds and the acceptability of new dressing materials. Thank you Cressida. It's evident that there were several technologies with various intended functions being developed in parallel by the Derma project team, involving collaborations with several laboratories. I also asked Cressida about the involvement of designers and digital animators in the project and how they were able to help the researchers to stay focused on the scientific goals of the project. As you can probably tell, one of the things we're very interested in at Portsmouth is how we can utilise creative methodologies for health and wellbeing projects. Creative outputs can be used as research tools and teaching aids and for disseminating complex research findings to non-expert audiences and in an easy to understand and engaging way. One member of the Derma team we have not heard from as yet is Eurosante, based in Lille in France. Eurosante is an agency dedicated to tech transfer and business development in the life sciences sector. I asked Xavier Martin Ben Loche about the role Eurosante played in helping put the Derma Consortium in touch with people and businesses with an interest in wound dressing development. Yes, thank you. Eurosante is a leading agency here in the north of France that's, that's dedicated to bringing new healthcare innovations to market. In terms of the Derma Consortium, uh, we've been involved since the beginning to bring, to bring this market center design to the uh, to the project and all and so that all innovation and all products developed throughout the process 
have this market uh, approach uh, from the beginning so that we can then easily translate all discoveries and innovations to the, our industrial partners, but also and eventually to the patients. One of the things we, we did was uh, participate in two leading uh, partnering events uh, in the healthcare sector, which are BioFit and MedFit, uh, which, are, uh, which are organized by Oasante and which bring together researchers, clinicians, uh, technology transfer offices, industrials and startups together in order to foster innovation in such a way that new collaborations arise and that these uh, new innovations can get, can get to the market and to the patients. Thank you, Xavier. We've now seen how the Derma Consortium has been engaged with the development of novel technologies for the improved management of chronic dermal ulcers. In the final part of the programme, we will discover the key results of the project and discuss their significance towards better outcomes for patients suffering with chronic dermal wounds. Welcome back. Previously, we heard about the materials that the Derma team had been developing to help manage chronic wounds, including a material to prevent unpleasant odors emanating from a wound, a material loaded with an antimicrobial agent to gradually permeate a wound and control infection, and a material intended to change color when a new infection develops within a chronic dermal wound. It is now time to see what the Derma team have achieved. Firstly, I asked Derma team researcher and podiatrist Rachel Force of the Leaf Hospital to describe the results of a study assessing performance of a derma odour absorbing material produced at the University of Brighton. So wounds associated with inflammation and bacterial contamination can liberate malodorous gases from the wound bed. These are substances called volatile organic compounds. These compounds come in different structures and can include thiols, ketones, alkenes, dimethyl polysulfides, and in association with Pseudomonas aeruginosa, a specific volatile organic compound called 2-aminoacetophenone. Early in the DERMA project, a study investigating the ability of an activated carbon-containing agarose film to absorb malodorous thiols was conducted. It was found that this derma material in the proximity of thiols was able to significantly reduce their presence in both liquid and in air. The team then decided to investigate the ability of the derma material to absorb 2-aminoacetophenone. This is one of the malodorous volatile organic compounds produced by Pseudomonas aeruginosa in an infected wound, and it is associated with having a significant impact on patients' health and well-being. After obtaining ethical approval, 53 volunteers were asked to rate the odour from six randomised pots in which were placed samples that either contained no odour or the odour from 2-aminoacetophenone. The samples were either covered with the derma activated carbon containing material, a control dressing without the activated carbon, or no covering at all. The participants were unable to see the contents of each pot, and they were then asked to sniff each container and to state if they could detect a strong odour, a slight odour, or no odour at all. The participants were able to sample each container up to three times during the study to enable them to quantify their response. Once decided, the participants' response was recorded by one of the research team. The results indicated that the derma-activated carbon material was able to significantly reduce the odour present in the laboratory testing procedure as assessed by healthy human volunteers. This is indicated by the significant reduction in the bar height indicated here in the very last column on the chart. 
It can also be seen that the score is as low as that of the sample with no odour also covered by the derma activated carbon material. This indicates that the activated carbon material was able to eliminate any background odours such as the plastic used to house the samples when compared with the samples that had no covering or the control material. Thank you Rachel. The following animation gives a representation of how this derma material may be applied to a patient in future to help manage a malodorous wound. A patient has presented with a chronic dermal ulcer. A dressing is required to cover the wound effectively and comfortably in order to help it heal. The derma material is flexible, breathable, conforms to the contours of the skin and can be cut to the desired shape, potentially making it suitable for application between the toes, round the heels and other hard to dress areas. Chronic ulcers can liberate offensive odours. The derma prototype contains activated carbon particulates to remove unpleasant odours produced in the wound. By preventing wound odours from leaving the dressing, it is expected that patient stress and anxiety will be greatly reduced. We learned earlier about electrospun fibres and how the University of Ghent has been developing these for the controlled release of antimicrobial agents to help control infection in a chronic wound. I asked Dr Tom Gaysons of the Polymer Chemistry and Biomaterials Group at the University of Ghent to describe the results of this work. One of the compounds that we started integrating in our uh, electrospun dressings is povidone iodine uh, and povidone iodine could then be released slowly from these um, from these electrospun mats. Uh, in contrast with the current commercially available uh, wound dressings on the market, our uh, material was designed to be slow release. So most uh, um, materials that are on the market today, the wound dressings that are on the market today, they actually have a burst release. So what does that mean? It means that in a very short uh, time frame, all the antibacterial is released in like half an hour, an hour. So in this graph, we can actually see the comparison between uh, derma dressing and the commercial dressing in terms of uh, released iodine in light blue and uh, the inhibition zone in dark blue. So here we see that the derma material uh, releases less iodine uh, than the commercial dressing, where we see a very uh, big burst release uh, for the commercial dressing. Um, but the um, inhibition zone of the commercial dressing is a lot smaller than for the derma dressing. So this means that the derma dressing will have a more prolonged uh, effect on the wound uh, in light of uh, antibacterial properties. In this figure uh, we can see the comparison between the derma dressing and the commercial dressing in terms of uh, half-life. So what is half-life? Half-life means uh, the time that is needed to uh, get half of the iodine concentration leached out. Um, so we can see that for a commercial dressing, uh, it only takes 10 minutes uh, before half of the iodine is released into the environment. Whereas for our dressing, it takes about two and a half hours to get to half of the concentration of iodine, which means it's a slower release of um, your iodine in the wound. One of the big goals of this project to, was to actually make a wound dressing that was able to release uh, iodine in a longer time frame, so from 24 hours to 48 hours or even longer if possible. So with our material, uh, we obtained this uh, result, so we could actually release povidone iodine over a time frame of 24 hours to 48 hours, um, making it ideal and uh, for a wound dressing, because then it means, it means that doctors and nurses have to reapply the wound dressing much 
less frequent uh, than the uh, available dressings on the market today. Uh, the material itself, so the AUP, the hydrogel material, is extremely hydrophilic. And because it's very hydrophilic, it's binding a lot of water. And therefore, it can actually take up three to six times its own weight in water, uh, making it an ideal material to uh, use for wound dressings. In contrast to current commercial available materials, um, it can actually take three times more water up than the commercially available ones. Thank you, Tom. Here we can see a computer animation that depicts how such a material could be applied to a wound in the form of a dressing. The patient has presented with an infected chronic dermal ulcer. A dressing is required to cover the wound effectively and comfortably and to deliver antimicrobials to tackle the infection in order to help it heal. The derma antimicrobial material is flexible, conforms the contours of the skin and can be cut to the desired shape, potentially making it suitable for application between the toes, round the heels and other hard to dress areas. Bacterial infections within an ulcer require to be managed to allow healing to occur. The derma prototype contains an antimicrobial agent to tackle infection. The novel derma material can release the antimicrobial for a prolonged period, thereby controlling the infection with greater efficiency and potentially reducing the need for healthcare workers to change the dressing as often as is currently practiced. We also learned earlier about the derma team's work in developing a material that would change colour in the presence of an emerging bacterial infection. I asked Dr Ian Allen to describe the results of this work. The derma team was working on two versions of a diagnostic dressing using very similar materials. One, a film form based again on the use of plasticised agarose and an electrospun fibrous version. But I will describe here the results of the agarose film form. So the films were tested against uh, well-known problematic bacteria responsible for chronic wound infections including Staph aureus, E. coli and Pseudomonas aeruginosa. And the presence of bacteria was indeed able to be detected by these films by way of a stark colour change from blue to fluorescent pink caused by activation of the dye held within the film. And we found that we could immobilise the dye in sheets of a non-toxic polymer matrix and encapsulate these sheets within laminates of our swellable agaros films. This allowed our diagnostic material to take up fluid that contained bacteria and then respond by producing a colour change. Uh, we anticipate that this would also occur if our material subject to ethical and regulatory approval um, is applied to infected wounds on patients. We made a technological breakthrough quite late in the project and though we haven't yet proven this, we hope that in future it will be possible to calibrate uh, the material to change colour in a predictable way according to the thickness of the dye loaded matrix and also the concentration of bacteria it is exposed to. Um, this could allow for a range of diagnostic materials that would be able to indicate different severities of wound infection. At present, uh, depending on the formulation used, our films start to change colour after a few minutes of contact with growing bacteria and then the reaction progresses over the next few hours until the colour transition is complete. In this time-lapse video, the diagnostic material on the right has been placed on a lawn of E. coli bacteria growing at body temperature. The material on the left is not in contact with bacteria. The colour transition from blue to pink is shown developing over a period of 2 hours 20 minutes. So the next phase of the work will be to fine tune and calibrate this response. Thank you, Ian. The following animation depicts the colour change that an ulcerated patient will notice if an infection erupts within their wound.
patient has presented with a wound of uncertain prognosis. A dressing is required to cover the wound effectively and comfortably in order to help it heal. Bacteria within the wound are starting to multiply. The dividing bacteria produce chemical changes within the wound. The derma material is a transparent film infused with a special dye which reacts to the increasing numbers of bacteria. The molecules of the dye respond by changing colour, indicating that a bacterial infection is developing within the wound. The colour change will alert healthcare workers that further intervention is required to manage the wound. We have seen that the derma team has produced materials that appear to hold much promise for future treatment of patients with chronic wounds. But what hurdles are still to be overcome before these materials are available in clinic for the treatment of patients? I asked Professor Matteo Santin of the Centre for Regenerative Medicine and Devices at the University of Brighton about the regulatory steps a potential dressing material must satisfy before being approved for patient use. The regulation of uh, uh, medical devices is obviously um, looking at both the uh, safety of the patient uh, as well as the uh, uh, industrial uh, feasibility. Uh, the, uh, in the case of uh, wound dressing, um, these are uh, devices that have been uh, uh, historically um, categorized as uh, um, class 2B uh, medical uh, implants. The, uh, evolution of the regulatory framework, however, has made them, uh, has made their uh, um, uh, approval uh, to the market uh, more uh, stringent. So from uh, looking uh, the, at the uh, toxicity aspects of the materials that have uh, um, been considered by the manufacturer, by the uh, R&D uh, project, um, to the, their validation in terms of uh, uh, in vivo um, um, testing, uh, clinical uh, uh, trials, and finally uh, the efficacy. Uh, it is obviously a long and a, a rather expensive uh, process requiring investment. But uh, basically, the need for uh, medical uh, uh, devices, uh, particularly wound dressing of a new generation, um, is uh, um, becoming more and more, uh, has been becoming more and more relevant if uh, considered that uh, the clinical need is uh, widening um, uh, in the aging population as well as with the higher incidence of some uh, uh, diseases like. Uh, uh, diabetes uh, leading to uh, foot ulcers and uh, uh, problem with the chronic uh, uh, wounds. The DERMA project fits very well in uh, uh, this uh, process of uh, development because uh, alongside the innovative approach can indeed um, is already basically um, developed and uh, uh, design to fulfill the more uh, stringent regulations that I've just uh, mentioned. Thank you, Matteo. Satisfying the regulatory demands on a new material before bringing it into clinical use does seem to be a formidable challenge. Therefore, I asked Dr. Brian Griffiths of BG Healthcare about his experiences of doing just that, developing a wound dressing that did make it to clinic. I, I was very fortunate in that um, I've been involved in teams that have developed uh, multiple dressings that have made it to, to market. And that process um, can be quite a long-winded process. It's, it, it involves lots of different facets of development, not just the development of the dressing itself, but aspects around regulatory, um, aspects about clinical evidence. Um, there are lots of elements of manufacture that need to be resolved when you, you're in development. Um, and a whole host of other things around 
stability, et cetera, and packaging. Um, and all of those things need to be considered um, before you get to the point where your sales and marketing team are happy then to kind of take that product and get it into a position for long. So there are lots of different aspects um, involved in the development of addressing. I think lots of people consider that the development is a very technical thing. And certainly the, the inventors get very close to the product and uh, that's all they see very often. If you're, if you're fortunate enough to be in a large organization, there are other people worrying about the regulatory and clinical aspects of addressing whilst you as an inventor get to stick with the product, make many iterations of your design, um, constantly improving that design and constantly testing that design before you get to a point where you are then ready to get that product into a clinical setting. So, so the development phase is, is long and complex and very often in large organizations involve multiple teams to make that uh, make that final project a reality or make that final product a reality. I also asked Brian what advice he would give to scientists who are developing materials that they believe have great potential for patients. So my advice really to, to any new designers is to be bold. Um, we are now in a, in a phase where advanced wound care products really exceed those of um, traditional products. And so designers have been kind of pushing this space uh, for a number of years now. Um, my advice, I guess, would be to think about things like smart bandaging that really tells you something about the wound interface. I think that is a very exciting kind of area to be working in and kind of gives us an, another kind of option when we think about treating chronic wounds. So um, that's the advice, just be bold in your thinking and, and um, push the boundaries if you're able to. Thank you, Brian. Finally, I asked project leader, Dr. Ian Allen to sum up his thoughts on the success of the Derma project and the benefits he hopes it will bring to society. Derma was certainly an ambitious project and I'm really pleased with what we managed to achieve. Some of the technologies will continue to be developed, perhaps with the help of additional investment with a view to getting these to market. Only by doing this can the expected benefits for patients be realised and of course that is why we undertook the work to help improve the health and well-being of patients with chronic wounds. I'd really like to thank the Interreg 2Cs programme for providing so much support and encouragement to the DERMA team during the project. It's been a great experience to work with so many talented colleagues working across disciplines and from different countries, um, all on a common objective. Personally, I really hope that the DERMA consortium continues to work together uh, despite the very different political landscape that exists at the end of the project compared with the start. I think people will always find a way to work together if the will is there. And of course, with work comes friendship too. I'm quite sure that across Europe, there'll be other groups of workers who share similar feelings about their own projects and that will see a determination to maintain the links and friendships that have been so valued by us all. Thank you, Ian. And thank you for watching. Goodbye. This is where derma comes in. This activated charcoal product can be incorporated into dressings or wound management systems like negative pressure dressings. Can you imagine what a difference it would make for our patients? It will enhance their quality of life immeasurably. And I look forward to derma in clinical use one day. I can't detect any odour, but if it helps your peace of mind, we could use a dressing that's designed to remove any odours. Would you like me to use one of these? Yes, that would be helpful. Okay, I can do that. You haven't got one that could tell if it's infected, have you? Not yet, but there is one that's being designed to do just that. A dressing that would change colour in response to increasing bacteria in the wound. Hopefully that won't be too far away. Ooh, a dressing that would change colour if it's infected, that would really help you stop worrying. Yes, it would be helpful, as if you notice changes in colour, you would know to contact the hot foot line straight away. But until then, we need to look out for the usual signs of infection.